Hello, Booktube, and welcome back to your Daily Penguin. This is my slow march of the penguins, my waddle of the penguins through my penguin wall. Uh, book by book, author by author, we are mostly in the ancient world now. We have bounced around from the ancient Hebrews of the Bible, uh, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Egyptians, and the ancient Romans. And under the umbrella of ancient Romans, we are including, I am including books that uh, deal with the history of Rome, were written by people who were serving Rome in one capacity or another, who lived in the broad swath of the Roman Empire, but not always, especially the later we go in time, am I talking about an actual Roman? Uh, that isn't even true in the Republican era, where you have, you have new men coming in from out of town <laughs> and, and striking it, like Cicero, striking it big in the city. And the, the later in time we go and the broader the empire gets, the more likely that is to happen, including the author that we have today, who has a Roman-sounding name, but was, was not born in Rome, was born in the Roman province of Bithynia <laughs> in around AD 163. This is Cassius Dio. And this Penguin Classic volume uh, is called the, the, it's the Roman history, but it's called the Reign of Augustus. It's translated by Ian Scott Kilvert, I think. Ian Scott Kilvert, yes. And uh, uh, Cassius Dio was, I mean, despite the fact that he wasn't born a Roman, he wasn't born in Rome, he wasn't born in Italy, even so, he was the son of a consul. And even in uh, AD 163, he was, he, even that late in the empire's history, a consul was still a big deal. It was the, the highest ceremonial office that you could have in the Roman government. It, it didn't mean much of anything anymore because by AD 163, certainly, the, the Roman Empire had become an uh, Eastern-style absolute potentate. It was the, uh, an autocracy of, of the very most strict kind where all the power of the state, all the power of the military, all the power of, of the state religion, everything rested in one person, the emperor. Uh, and... <laughs> Cassius Dio was the son of a consul, and he quickly rose in the ranks uh, of, of the Roman world. Uh, because, say what you want about the ancient Romans, and, and certainly there's plenty to be said, it was, within limits, a socially fluid world. Someone like Cicero, a new man from Arpinium, could come to, could come to Rome and become consul. Someone like Pompey. Pompey, who, who called himself Pompey the Great, could, could become the master of the entire Roman world. And many other people, we've seen many other people like that, poets, historians, uh, including emperors, starting with the Roman Emperor Trajan and moving on from there. People could come from the provinces and, and achieve the highest rank of society. Uh, the only way you achieve the highest rank of society, the very highest rank in Cassius Dio's day, was to either be born a relative of the sitting emperor or to be positioned to, to take troops against him in battle and win. Uh, usually, there are almost a, a tiny handful of exceptions. But aside from that, below that imperium, below that incredible height, Cassius Dio ascended higher even than his own father did. Uh, and he did it first in Bithynia, and then he moved closer and closer to the seats of Roman power and closer and closer to the ruling world until finally he, he became a consul in Rome. Uh, uh, he ended the, <laughs> the thing about, one of the things we're going to talk about, about Cassius Dio, is that, as I mentioned, by this point Rome had become a despotism. Whether you, whether you associate that with tyrants or not, it had become a governmental system in the form of one person. And people abased themselves to that person, and oh, there was no alternate source of power. It's an unhealthy system in the American view now. Of course, the American Revolution was fought to overthrow exactly that kind of concentration of power in one place. Uh, there were plenty of people in Cassius Dio's day, and since, and before, who would say that it is the best system of government that mankind has yet devised, because it makes a family out of all of the citizens. Basically, that's what it does. You've got a family at the top. And... <laughs> Whether or not that's true, Cassius Dio's life and, com and career show clearly one undeniable fact about living under absolute monarchs like this, whether it's uh, Soviet Russia or, or Romanov Russia, or Imperial Russia, or whether it's all the ages of Chinese history, or whether it's uh, all the ages of, of English history until, until 
the Constitution, until the constitutional monarchy started to become the way of the land. In all of those cases and all the others, by far, by far the majority, 99% of, of humans who have lived on Earth under any kind of governmental system have lived under a monarchy, basically a monarchy, usually an absolute monarchy backed by the military. And in all of those cases, you see as true something that is true for Cassius Dio, which is that it's a roll of the dice, whether or not you live under good emperors or bad good kaisers are bad, good czars are bad, whatever the word is. It's a roll of the dice whether or not you get a good one or a bad one. And it might not affect the ordinary man in the street all that much, except that bad ones tend to uh, succumb to civil war, and then the ordinary man in the street dies, and the streets run with blood. But under most circumstances, the ordinary man in the street, the, the baker down in the Sabura, he he is going to get along basically the same whether the emperor is is what we'd call good or bad but the higher up you go the closer you get to the sun the more important it is to you what kind of a star it is and cassius dio had horrible luck with emperors he really did he entered power in rome under commodus who was a vindictive vicious insane tyrant and he he served under a number of other bad emperors <laughs> which is which is it can be lethal, of course, obviously, it can be lethal, but even if it's not lethal, it seems to me that he was a smooth character. He probably learned it at his father's knee. So if if anybody was going to survive the turmoil of civil war, which he did, and, and imperial intrigue, it was going to be Cassius Dio, but even so, he had to deal with, with emperors like Caracalla and Elagabalus, these people who were... Their psychological case studies are as bad, about as bad as emperors gets. Commodus the same way. Nothing to write home about. And... Uh, when that happens, you can do a few things. You can be obsequious. You can flatter if you really want to stay in the public eye, if you really want to stay in power. Power, keep, keep in mind, civil, civic power like this is addictive, intensely addictive. People don't walk away from it, even when they have to abase themselves. They don't walk away from it. So if you look at human history under any kind of, of uh, autocracy, and you see this. You, you, you read any kind of account, and your first question is, well, why did you stay? If your life was being threatened, yes. Like, for instance, Stalin, if you desert him, you die. You don't get to retire to your Dhaka on the, you know, on the Black Sea. You, you would be, you'd be executed. But there are plenty of tyrants who didn't care. Once you were out of their sight, they didn't, they didn't care. They weren't going to hunt you down. And yet people stayed. And the question is always why, and that's the answer. Because power is addictive, even when, you're not, when it's not ultimate power. Uh, Cassius Dio did a little of both. He was obsequious. He... he bit his tongue and sang praises and stayed on, on uh, Caracalla's staff for quite a bit of time. Uh, also didn't. He, he did both. He, he stayed kissing the boot of power, and he also retired from public life for long stretches of time under, under Caracalla and Elagabalus. Uh, and he comes back to power under a good emperor, Septimius Severus. Uh, and that's when you see another fringe benefit of living under a good emperor. Relatively good. A good, a good enough emperor, certainly not a monster. When you, when you don't live under a monster, all of a sudden you're free. Not just to pursue your own careers and have a bit of business on the side owning a string of brick manufacturing warehouses or whatever without the emperor standing there, or the emperor's thing, standing there right in the doorway and saying, I want 90% of your profits. Not only that, but also you're free in other ways too. Imagine if you are... Uh, creative and you just happen to come into your own under a vicious dim-witted autocrat someone who hates creativity and maybe doesn't allow you to do it that is horrible that is absolutely horrible or who, who says you can be as creative as you want as long as all of it is screaming my praise think of of german intellectuals under the nazis the, who had a horrible choice do i do i change my colors like a chameleon and do whatever I need to in order to continue to publish books and read in the, in the privacy of my own home and hope that things don't get worse? Or do I leave and risk everything? Or do I stay and risk everything? And most of the ones that stayed died. And we have these horrible, horrible stories from the Nazi years of uh, their wife being sent a bloodied pair of spectacles in the mail. And that's the only way the wife knows that her husband, the scholar, is dead and has been brutally tortured before he died. Cassius Dio faced a lot of those same problems, and when it came to Septimius Severus, he suddenly had a way out. He was suddenly 
respected again. He was in the highlight of power again. And he had been writing his whole life. As far as we can tell, he had been writing one way or another his whole life. Clearly with a yen to write history. Uh, and he wrote a history, the Roman history, this, this book here is not the whole thing by any means, but he wrote an enormous work of history from the founding of the city to the reign of Septimius Severus. And before he wrote that book, he, he worked on that book enormously, according to him. He researched it for, ten, for over 10 years and wrote it for over 10 years. Uh, but before that, he wrote a shorter book chronicling some of the civil unrest that had given birth to, for instance, Septimius Severus' reign. And he presented it to the emperor, and the emperor liked it very much and gave it his blessing which was a huge deal, as you can imagine. It would be it's a, every bit as huge a deal as it would be anywhere. Uh, the, the, when the autocrat nods, suddenly, if he nods in your direction, suddenly things go better for you. And, uh, and Cassius Dio, at one point in his history, I'm not sure if it's in this volume, but at one point in his history, he does a classic writer's self justification He says that, that he was so pleased with the emperor's nod in his direction, with the emperor's acknowledgement of his, of his work, that he went home. And when he went home, he had a dream. And in a dream, he was divinely inspired to write a work of history <laughs> in, which, in which the same emperor who gave him the nod of approval was tacitly the pinnacle and end achievement of all of Roman history. <laughs> Gee, isn't it funny how visions work? <laughs> but anyway, he did that. He wrote a long history, and we have a bit of it. We don't have anywhere near all of it, but we have a bit of it. And the textual history for the bit that we have is fairly good. There's a lot of later summaries that maybe aren't so good. Uh, and we have enough to know what the whole work would have been like. And this this is translated, yes, this is translated by Ian Scott Kilbert, this Penguin classic version, and it just concentrates on the reign of Augustus, who, in this kind of hindsight, over a century of hindsight, looks wonderful <laughs> to, to a, a man who had been through Commodus and Caracalla and Elagabalus. He looks wonderful. Augustus looks wonderful and can be used both as a homily and as hagiography. Uh, very comforting to Romans of, that, of, who were Dio's readership, and, and there were a lot of them. This, was, this book was excerpted and circled around and published in part and did was very popular in its day. Uh, and this is a very smooth translation. I think we've mentioned Ian Scott Kilbert before. It, this Penguin Classic has probably the saddest dedication that any Penguin Classic could possibly have in memory of Betty Raddus who had been a guiding spirit for Penguin Classics forever and ever. She was a guiding spirit to this project in its initial stages. But she was dead by the time it came out, and uh, that's pretty sad. But this is a magnificent volume. It's a shame that, once again, just speaking editorially, it's a shame that Penguin Classics doesn't, didn't, doesn't have a bigger a volume of Cassius Dio that's twice as big. But maybe it's understandable, because... <laughs> Cassius Dio had everything that you would want in an ancient Roman historian. He had an outsider's position. He wasn't actually from Rome. He had access to a ton of primary sources. If you go through here and compare, we know some of his sources. Tacitus. Suetonius. We know some of the sources that he tends to avoid. For instance, Livy. And because we know those, it's kind of like having the Rosetta Stone key. We can, If we know those sources, we can tell when he's venturing into, into revelations and specifications for which we have no ancient source, so that we can guess that he had sources, plenty of them, that we don't have, including the autobiography of Augustus. Uh, that is fascinating, and he had access to all of those. He also had an enormous amount of experience. He knew all about the workings of the provinces. The provinces are, are uh, pre present in this history in a way they aren't present in any other Roman history. He commanded troops. He governed a province. At one point, if I remember correctly, the person who wrote, I think the introduction here, the introduction is by John Carter. And uh, I believe in his introduction, if I remember correctly, uh, he says, well, we don't know, uh, we don't know exactly why there were pauses in Cassius Dio's work output. Maybe he was just too busy as governor of a Roman province to write to work on his work, on his book, uh, which goes a long way towards showing you that uh, that uh, John Carter was probably never a governor of a Roman province <laughs> because it's all about delegation. You, you can certainly get a history written. He probably had a lot of other irons in the fire, including probably a lot of other books that we know nothing about. Uh, but 
the one thing that Cassie Steo didn't have, the one thing that he couldn't bring to this massive project that took him so long to research and so long to write was writing talent. <laughs> he didn't have any writing. He's a boring writer, <sighs> unfortunately. And it's just the whims of chance that we have him and we don't have a lot of far more interesting writers, maybe some of whom he relied on. Uh, and he had a ghost looking over his shoulder when he was writing history, because uh, and it's a ghost we know, because we've seen it already. At, at right around the time that the, the, the satirist Lucian was writing a long book on how to write history and doing a fantastic takedown job of so many famous kinds of history and so many famous historians almost naming them. Certainly they would be immediately, they're immediately identifiable to us. 2,000 years later, they would have been immediately identifiable to Lucian's readers. And it was a, an inescapable little piece, a little, a little dialogue, a little essay. It was inescapable in, in, its, in its way. It had the same kind of long-term shock value that, for instance, uh, Mark Twain's great essay on James Fenimore Cooper's literary offenses had pretty much put, that, that essay pretty much killed a certain subgenre of adventure fiction as soon as people read it, because <laughs> all of a sudden the light is on in the back corner of the room and you can see every detail of everything that everybody's been doing so lazily. Uh, Cassius Dio had that, the ghost of that, of that Lucian piece sort of looking over his shoulder while he was writing. And of course, we've mentioned this before many times when writing about Roman, or talking about Roman history, uh, is one of those is the speeches. The speeches that are in Roman and Greek histories up to a certain point and even after a certain point in a very stylized kind of way. You have a crux of a moment and you have characters from history give speeches. And it's very obvious, not just to us, but to the, the contemporary readers at the time, that of course that wasn't what was actually said, if anything was. It's more rumination on what's at stake, a rumination on the philosophy or the, the, the background ideology of the things that matter in the passage. It's, it's a way, it's kind of a personalized historical essay that the historian works into the narrative of the chronicle. And uh, Lucian had, had harsh things to say about the speeches. Uh, we've seen historians who try to do away with them completely. We've seen historians like Livy who indulge in them gloriously. Uh, Cassius Dio indulges in them quite a bit, but not particularly gloriously. It's interesting from a rhetorical standpoint, certainly. It's interesting, but you, you have to smile a little. I'll read you just a bit. This is from a, a, part, of, a part of the history. This is allegedly Macenus, who was Augustus's sort of uh, cultural czar, sort of a public relations cultural literary envoy or whatever. Uh, and he's, he's talking to Augustus here, who's, who's, has taken over control of the Roman state. Uh, I also advise you never to exercise your authority to the full against your subjects as a whole nor to regard it in any way diminished if you do not put it into practice all the measures you could impose. Instead, the greater your power to carry out all that you desire, the more eager you should be that, you des that your desires in all matters should be limited to what is fitting. Always examine your heart in private as to what, whether in a given situation you are acting rightly or not, and as to what you should do or refrain from doing to earn your subject's love, so that you may follow the one course and avoid the other. You should not suppose that the world considers you to be doing your duty merely because you hear nobody actually blaming you, nor expect that any man would be so foolhardy as to find fault openly with any of your actions. No one will do this, no matter how gravely he may be wronged. On, on the contrary, many people feel obliged to actually praise their persecutors in public while they struggle to conceal their indignation. The ruler must learn to recognize the state of mind of his subjects not from what they say, but from what it is natural for them to think. And that is aimed at Cassius Dio's present emperor and maybe his successors. I am not I am not a crystal ball, I am not a psychic, I do not have a palantir, but I can 100% guarantee you that Messina's never said anything like that to Augustus. There was a thing called a pugio that Romans used to have, certainly an old-time brawler like Augustus would have had them. It was a strap of leather across your knuckles with a squat, triangular knife blade. It was very good for, it was easy to conceal in the folds of your toga. It was easy to, to carry into public when you weren't technically supposed to carry weapons in public. Uh, and Augustus had one on him at all times. And if Messinus had tried to say anything like that by the third sentence, 
he would have had a Pugio straight in the heart. <laughs> that would have been that. So you see what I mean. And every Roman who read that in Cassius Dio knew perfectly well the same thing, that nothing like that was ever said. It was, instead, a treatise lodged into a history. Uh, and I, they have their interest. I, <laughs> I feel almost hypocritical saying that they, they tend to wear on you because I could take them and a million more years like them in Livy, and that boils down to the talent of the writer. That <laughs> boils down to the talent of the writer. This is another example where we have a historian who's in a perfect place, a perfect position, a perfect time, and with perfect equipment to write a great book, but does not have the talent to do so. So instead, what we have here is a good book. Um, it's invaluable. We don't. We, <laughs> beggars can't be choosers. And it's fa if you're interested in in uh, the Augustus's lifetime, certainly, but also Dio's own lifetime. As you can tell from that speech, that is largely directed at his own time. And a lot of other stuff that's in here is, too. You'd have to know a little bit about that time. But in either case, you're going to want to read this eventually. Uh, and I'm very glad that Penguin made this copy. I got, I got my copy of this uh, probably 40 years ago. Um, 30 or 40 years ago. I was, I was in a retail bookstore. I was in a new bookstore with a friend of mine who was not particularly bookish. He liked to pretend that he was, but he wasn't. He wasn't particularly bookish. And I, I guess, was browsing too long, and he really wanted to go. And so he said, how about I buy you whatever you want, and then we leave. <laughs> and I, I picked this. Uh, and I've reread it since then, but as you can tell, I haven't reread it as much as I've reread any Livy or any Tacitus. It's, it's just a question of the talent you bring to bear. <laughs> so, but I'm glad he got his voice out there, and I'm glad that Penguin did it. Uh, so that is our, our Penguin Classic for today. It's a Roman history uh, of the reign of Augustus. And it's a long way off from the reign of Augustus, but it's a lot closer than a lot of other people. So we'll, we'll take it. For ancient history, we'll take it. We have to, it's not close enough to the reign of Augustus for anybody to know. You, you, have to, you, have to take, you have to keep in your mind that it's by Cassius Dio and that he, you know, didn't set foot in Italy until he was a grown man. And certainly he's, he's decades and decades and decades too late for any kind of eyewitnesses or any kind of stuff like that. He's researching this through books. And he's filtering it through his own uh, rhetorical objectives in his own day. So you have to keep all of that in mind. But even so, he, he spent a long time on it and made an, an ostentatious display of his accuracy. Whether he changed things at the end, he still did the, all of the research. And we can feel out the x-ray of that when we read the work. Even, I, again, I wish this were all of it, but you can get all of it in the low classical library edition, so there you go. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, but we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.